I think you'd have to be on another planet not to have recognized the way in which the ideas of natural capital have come into the environmental space. And um, this is an extraordinarily exciting time for economists and scientists to talk to each other and work out how to take things forward. Uh, we have a 25-year plan. Uh, we have uh, a government commitment to leave the environmental environment in a better state. We have 10 goals that governments wish to pursue. Uh, but filling in the detail, practically what's required to do that and how it may be done, what the metrics are, what the units, all those kinds of issues are up for grabs. And I can't think of anyone better to wade into that territory and indeed challenge economists too than my colleague on the uh, Natural Capital Committee, Cathy Willis. Uh, I'm sure she's very well known to all of you. Uh, she is the Professor of uh, Biodiversity at Oxford, Principal of St Edmunds Hall, has spent five years, I think, I think from the outside, it's fair to say, transforming science at Kew. And um, much more important than all of those things, she's thought long and hard about how practically to translate ideas, metrics, measurements, maps into concrete, practical things that we can do to deliver that 25-year plan. And uh, I, as an economist, can, of course, say that will improve prosperity. It will. It's good for the economy, good for sustainable growth, but it's good for the environment too. And I'm really looking forward this evening to listening to what Cathy has to say. And Cathy's going to talk for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll have about 20 minutes uh, for questions and answers after that. So please welcome Cathy to give this year's Burntwood Lecture. Thank you. And thank you very much for having me. It's great to be amongst environmental scientists because that's where I started my own research, doing a degree in environmental science, so right at the beginning. So the topic and the question, can we put a price on biodiversity? Before I start, I do want to define what I mean by biodiversity, and maybe everyone in this room knows what I mean by biodiversity, but in fact, 70% of the UK population don't. They thought, they thought when there was, a, when there was a, a, an assessment and a, a interviews, 70% thought it was washing powder. <laughs> so what do we mean by biodiversity? Well, biodiversity, of course, is the, is the beautiful species. I've picked some UK biodiversity, the slipper orchid. We've got the red deer on rum. We've got at the bottom here, we've got a, a mixed uh, uh, deciduous forest. And we've, of course, got these fantastic landscapes. This one's from the Cotswolds. But of course, as we all know, there are these competing demands that we're having to deal with on a daily basis. We all want biodiversity, we all want beautiful landscapes, and we want areas for recreation, cultural services. But of course, we all want land as well for food, for biofuels, uh, for timber, for clean water. And we want land for infrastructure. High speed 20, uh, the high-speed railway would be a classic example of that. Those conflicts the whole time between these, these different demands on land. Now, there is a recognition, as Dita was pointing out, of course, that the, the, many of us want to leave the environment in a better, better state, and we know there is massive degradation going on, and it's going unabated, particularly biodiversity. Now, one of the things I did when I was at Kew was pull together a state of the world's plants in 2016. And I think, for me, at that point, when you're looking at a global scale, even bring it down to the local UK scale, you realise the scale of the issue that we're dealing with. If we look at the top here, if we look at land cover change, for example. So this is from two, uh, 2001 to 2012, the difference. And these are percentages. And these are different classes. So this is mangroves. So there's 25% change in mangroves, from mangroves to golf courses, to roads, to beaches. Um, and even some of the ones we'd know around here, we've got a temperate coniferous forest. There's a big loss. Now, there are some areas it's expanding, but the vast majority, majority of land is switching for these other uses. 78% of the world's, if you look at it from a satellite imagery now, 78% has got a human imprint on it from space. Massive, massive transformation of our terrestrial surface. So much so that around 21% of global plant species are currently threatened with extinction, according to the IUCN Red List. One in five. 
really dramatic. So what are we going to do about it? Well, there have been many, many approaches to trying to conserve and manage biodiversity. But I think two of the ones that have really captured the international um, platform are, are, are this whole, these ideas that have been driven forward predominantly by economists about saying one of the issues with biodiversity is we don't value it. We don't put a price on it, and therefore we don't think it's something that we need to worry about when we're looking at these other compete, competing aspects for land. And so the, one of the first things that came through was in 2005, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. And this assessment started to say what nature is important for people, what nature underpins everyday aspects of human life. And then the second one here, the T, the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity, started to say, well, how much does it cost? What is it worth? Now, I often use this one because I think those are very nice, but they're quite abstract. But it's actually when you start to look at landscapes, then you can start to think about what that means on a landscape. Now, I normally show this to biodiversity conservationists, and I say, where on this landscape is the most biodiverse part? And actually, it's interesting. It's with, the st with the students in particular, it's quite interesting. So the bright ones, well, the, so the, the ones in the front row who are half asleep normally say, well, it's that one there because it's forest. But the brighter ones look and say, well, it's that one there because you've got a mosaic landscape, so you've got a higher level of biodiversity there. Everyone thinks this thing's completely devoid, and as for the single tree, you could cut it down. And that actually, the mountains are not worth anything. But if you split that landscape up, actually, all of it has a value. So at the bottom here, it's, this, is, this is the important flat land in the valley basement for provisioning for growing of crops or biofuels. This single tree, if those crops require pollination, then you need to have, a, 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 um, you need to have habitat nearby for the pollinators. Most pollinators cannot fly more than a kilometer. So you need to have that habitat, those foraging habitats nearby. This forest here, it's monodominant, pretty boring, but it's really important for carbon drawdown as a regulating service. And right at the top here, this is where you'll get your iconic birds. This is your cultural landscape. So you're seeing the partitioning of the landscape in a very, very different way. But in each of those examples, the biodiversity in that landscape has a value because of the societal benefit it's providing. <clears throat> so it's, but it's not just the biodiversity. I think this is an important point, and actually up to a room full of environmental scientists, I don't probably need to make this point because it's also the soils, the hydrology, the geology, and the atmosphere in here. And these are all natural capital stocks. So the top ones here are your biodiversity, but underneath you also have these other assets in here, or the other stocks. And it's, the, it's a function of the extent, the quality, the spatial configuration of these that leads on to your ecosystem services, such as your pollination, your biomass, your carbon drawdown, water purification, even clean air or the particulate matter. Think about trees in cities, the amount of uptake of the, of the nitrous oxides by trees. And all of those then provide these societal benefits. So in a sense, that is, your, that is your natural capital. It's these stocks and these flows that lead on to your societal benefits. And nature, it's putting a value, in a sense, on nature, but not a value in terms of pounds, but a value in terms of the things that they are providing. But of course, that's all, I think most people in the room would agree with that, I hope. <laughs> um, but I think the problem comes on when the minute you start to talk about pounds, or you start to talk about putting a value on something that many people will see biodiversity as something that we should rightly have a right to and something that we should automatically value because of its beauty or because of the sort of inherent nature of it. But if you're an economist, there are two viewpoints about how you frame natural, the value of nature. And the first one is viewing natural capital, including nature, as as utility, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. But the second one is viewing nature as assets. What's the difference? So here is our nature. We've got fish. I'm not actually sure the sort of fish you eat, but they were the easiest ones I could get. And we've got your timber at the bottom. So two fish stocks and timber stocks, two natural capital assets. They're both nature-based. Now, if you're viewing natural capital as a utility, when you value this, you won't be valuing these. What you're actually valuing, in the case of fish, you'd be valuing the fish fingers. What, how much do the fish fingers cost? Minus the cost of the production. If it's the timber, you'd be valuing 
the timber planks minus the cost of <coughs> producing them and cutting them down. So your value then is actually on here. It's, these have no value. The value is entirely upon what you can get from nature. Now, is that, is that right? Well, there's a huge problem with this for biodiversity. Let me give you an example then. So rainforest in Brazil, beautiful mixed rainforest in here. So if you value it according to its utility, the number one utility, as we often hear about, is the stream of services, the excellent carbon dioxide drawdown that this forest provides. But if you're basing it on the value, look at this other forest. Eucalyptus plantation, monodominant. Absolutely the same value, because it's fantastic for drawing down CO2, but look what happens to the biodiversity. So by focusing on the, on the utility, you can very quickly lose sight of the, all those other aspects that we should be thinking about. So what about assets then? Well, if you view nature in terms of an asset, what an asset is, it's a, it effectively, it's a universal right. It's, it's, it's the assets to which citizens have this right because we know they underpin many societal outcomes. Now, this is in line with economic framings. You think about education or health. We don't think about necessarily the value of it or the services, the, the value of the service, at least not in this country, but infrastructure's welfare. It's a, it's, a, it's a given right, something that we want now, we want our children to have, we want our grandchildren to have in the future. And it very much focuses on, on then on stewardship. We shouldn't lose what we have. We should be looking to, uh, um, to basically enhance it. So you think about an asset sheet, and you're looking at, if you're a trustee of, a, of an asset, the last thing you want your asset to be doing is going down. You want your asset to stay stable or to increase. Now, if you look at assets then, you take your stocks in here, so your fish and your trees, this is the, uh, this is the government's, um, the, uh, the um, Natural Capital Government Office of the Na National Statistics. This is their asset sheet for the UK. Now, if you look in here for the stocks, they're not valuing these, they, what they're valuing are the stocks. So if you look at the fish, it's the number of, it's the it's stock at the end of year 2007 and the stock at the end of year 2014. It's the same with timber. Here we go, it's the stock in 2007 and the stock in, two, in 2014. So it's the amount of timber they have, not the services provided by the timber. So a very big difference in the way that you then frame it. Why am I focusing on framing? Well, if we move on to, well, first of all, let's compare then those two approaches. So your utility framing of nature treats people as consumers, whereas your asset framing treats people as citizens. We're all citizens and we all have a right to these assets. The aim for the utility is to get maximum value from parts of nature. Does that benefit nature? Possibly not. With an asset, the aim is to maintain and enhance assets and to stop further erosion. And so the problem with utility, as I explained before, those parts of nature that have less utility are likely to be ignored. Whereas with an asset, it tends to be in the whole system. I'll come on to examples in a minute. So this one, over this side, you're likely to result in further, more and more fragmentation of the landscape. Whereas this side, if we get it right, we could end up with an enhancement of our natural and our nature in this country and across the world. But the only problem is, and this is the, really the, where I'm going to take you, is this is quite easy. The fish finger example was an easy example, so was the wood. But this is much, much harder to value. And that's where we're all struggling, I think, both in the UK and across the world, of people who are coming up with natural capital asset sheets. So what about the government's 25-year plan then? And this is what Dieter was talking about. Well, if you look at this and think about that, it's very much framed within the asset framing. It's not about getting money from nature. It's about having nature because it's an asset that we all want going forwards. So the overarching aim of that plan is to leave the environment in a better state than at present. And by doing that, the argument is the societal benefits we'll get from that include things like clean air, plentiful water, 
thriving plants and wildlife, reduced harm from environmental hazards, enhanced beauty and adaptation to climate change. Who wouldn't want those things? These are what we're always saying we want to achieve. And the argument is from the 25 year plan and other work that people will be doing, that if we start to think of things in terms of assets and value them as assets, that will be a way to enhance and build on biodiversity in the UK and across the world. But there's also the suggestion that as a replacement of the common agricultural policy and cap, that actually payments should be made for these assets that provide these societal benefits. So we use public money to pay for the maintenance and enhancement of these public goods. <clears throat> Finally then, just to remind us what, what we're talking about here, the Office of National Statistics has this very good statement to think about what they think natural capital is. And it comes back to this asset. Natural capital assets can be viewed as the stock of natural capital that produces the flows of beneficial goods and services to people over time. So it's the benefits to society we're thinking about. So then, if we're going to give public money for public goods, or we're going to give private money for public goods, or private money, well, they're all public goods, but private money for them as well, I think there's four questions that we need to think about. The first one is, how do you determine which natural capital assets currently provide the greatest societal benefit? Why do I say that? Well, think about that, that first slide I showed you, not the, not the washing powder, the one after that. The one where you've got competing areas that you need for infrastructure, competing areas you need for food, and competing areas then you need for, for cultural, for recreation. So how do we work out spatially which parts of our nature provide those societal benefits that we really want, and therefore we need to be maintaining and enhancing. The second one is, once we've worked that out, is it possible to put a monetary value on it? How do we do it? The third question is not only maintaining, but how do we work out what to pay and where to enhance natural capital? And the last one, probably the most controversial, I would say, is, is does this really work for biodiversity? So I'm going to try and address these four questions then in the next uh, 30 minutes. So how do you determine which natural capital assets currently provide the greatest societal benefit? So let's start with a, um, a, a fairly easy one, because I think all of us are certainly live in Oxford. We had very bad flooding a couple of years ago. I think most people have been affected by flooding or sit know people who've been affected by flooding. And so... I think most people, especially everyone in this room, will know also that land cover can play a very large role in reducing overland flow and flooding. So your question really then, or the question we need to be asking, is on this landscape, this nature here, which, what's, what role do these trees and soil play in reducing overland flow and downstream flooding? How do we work it out? So this is work that's been done, has been done over the last couple of years, um, and it's a model uh, that was first of all developed by the, uh, the Met Office uh, with some people in the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, and we've been using this model and downscaling it. Now this model, it's a, it's a beautiful model, now works at about th every 30 metre pixel across, so you'd split up your river basin in this way. And it, it calculates based on knowledge of the soils, of the subsurface runoff, of the surface flow, and the land cover, it calculates for each pixel, how much, um, how much overflow there'll be based on that overflow of water, based on, that, on, the, on the composition of these features in that pixel. So, what you do is you run the model with the current land cover, which is what we did for a number of drainage basins in the UK, and you come up with this picture, and it, effectively this, this, this value here, and it'll tell you when you have a big storm event, it effectively tells you how the flow will go across the basin and the time it will come out through in the river. Now, you test that then against river flow from gauge catch catchments to see how accurate is this model. And at the bottom here, this is the model testing. So the black 
is the actual flow gauge catchments, and the red and the blue are the model. And as you can see, it, it does a pretty good job. It's a very nice model, this one. So once you've done that and you're confident in the output from that model against what is really happening in terms of overland flow, you can run the model again, but this time you take away the land cover. So you remove the land cover, but keep everything else the same. So by doing that, you can work out what role the land cover is playing in reducing overland flow. And the annual difference between that with the, 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 the flow that you have or the runoff routing you have when you have land cover versus that without gives you a model output that for every pixel you can then look at the contribution the vegetation is playing in that pixel towards reducing the overland flow. So here we have this one here. And so the red areas are areas that effectively behave like bare soil, whereas the blue areas actually the, the vegetation in those pixels is having a really significant impact on the flooding or reducing the flooding downstream. And so we did this for, um, and I'll come on, to, there's a bigger example that I'm going to come on to in a minute, but we did this for actually all the catchments around Oxford to look at how can you reduce flooding in Oxford by using natural capital or which natural capital assets around Oxford are important for stopping flooding in the city itself. So this is the even load catchment, and here we have the map. And this is, that this is down to a, a 100, 120 meter resolution. And across the individual farms, you can start to see which farmers have got trees on their farm that are really important for reducing flooding further down the river, and which farmers really ought to be planting some trees if we want to have the societal benefit in Oxford of reduced flooding. So it gives you a way of actually mapping and starting to understand the value of the assets, those natural capital assets, in terms of the societal benefit in this case, which is uh, reduced flooding. Let me give you another one then. And this is one that's uh, probably close to everyone's heart, and it's this question of cultural services, the recreation that we all like, from natural landscapes. So those landscapes can be something like the Lake District, it can be city parks, or it can just be parks that are not, that people go walking on the, on the footpath system, beautiful landscapes like this one in the Cotswolds. But we do need to know where are the most important areas then for this nature that people want to go and use for recreation? Because again, that's another benefit that we get from nature. And how do you work that out? So everyone always says, oh, that's easy. <laughs> it's not. Um, we just use the recreational visitor numbers. Well, of course, that's all well and good if, if everyone goes off to a National Trust property every weekend or somewhere where you pay to go in. But how many times in the last six months have you been somewhere where you don't pay to go in, to go walking, to go and join the landscape, to have those cultural services? Probably most of the time. Most, most time people go out, they don't pay. So this is one way of getting data. But the other way is actually to get data from people. When people go to beautiful landscapes, what they tend to do is get their phone out now and take a picture. And when they take their picture, some people, a lot of people actually, upload them onto a shared platform called Flickr. So what we did was for the UK, actually for the whole of Europe, we scraped the Flickr records. And we, we used those Flickr records and we've looked at them alongside the environmental covariates, so elevation, land cover, to say what sort of environments do people most often go to and take a photo of. So you effectively have a sort of distribution model based then on the environmental covariates, and we then use that to predict where people are most likely to go and enjoy um, are going to uh, take recreation. And we tested that model. We split the data and tested it. It was, had a remarkably robust um, result to that. So that's the second way we've been working this one through. But of course, density of human population also is very important here. How long it takes to get to an area, you have to consider that. You may have a very beautiful area in the middle of Norway, but it's useless because people can't get to it. So bringing all those together into a model, we ended up with this, this service of recreational amenity. Um, and 
I just must show you the UK. So the output for the UK, as you would imagine, areas immediately outside of London and outside the major cities had this much higher recreational value. But I've just thought I'd, I'd flagged up one here, which is in Wales, on sort of southern Wales. And you see the areas in lighter blue have a higher recreational value to them. So if, if you want to conserve or pay for assets for recreational value, these are, this is one way of working out how to do it. I'm just going to throw this one in at the end because this, this to me is one of the most interesting and very, very recent. And this is work that's actually been very much followed through by Public Health England. And it's about mental well-being associated or the association between mental well-being and, and greenness. So greenness as in natural greenness. And this team of uh, medics and psychiatrists, all they did was they, they looked at the photosynthetic health of the UK from the greenness you get from this was taken from satellite imagery. And this is at a very high resolution, 100 meters or 30 meter resolution here. And as you can see, some parts are much greener or a different color green to others. And you'll see there's these gradual changes in green according to your biodiversity health. Now what they found it's not the amount of space, it's the greenness that affects your mental well-being. So they compared this data to the UK Biobank data, which is, so you've got three or four years of a mental, for a million people, very big sample size. And it's the shade of green, um, and the, every time you move up an increment of green, your mental well-being outcome improves. Um, and the effects are more pronounced for women, for people less than 60 years in age and of the lower socioeconomic status. And this is not only a UK thing, the same things have been found in the US, in Catalonia, France, and South Africa. The same relationships are coming through. So this link between, I mean, I've given you these other two, recreation and, and water, but another really important link is this one between mental well-being and greenness. So I've given you three examples of how you might be able to map where are the important natural capital assets in order for, for societal benefit. But your next really thorny issue here is, can we put a value on them? So we go back to that diagram I showed at the beginning. You've got your, your assets themselves, your species or communities. Can we, can we put a value there? Or should we be putting the value here on the societal benefits obtained? And you can do both, and people have done both, and I'll show you examples of, of both. But I think, actually, well, you'll see what I say, but I think this, funnily enough, is much easier than that. So let's look at societal benefits, the other end of this, this um, framework. And this is always given as an example, and the reason people always give this is because probably this is the best example and probably one of the only examples I can find that really does work. So this is New York. So New York has, um, New York City's down here, but the water down through the Hudson River is cleaned, if you can say it, by two very large drainage basins, the Croton and the Catskill Mountains here. And these have beautiful trees in them, and those trees reduce the overland flow, and they remove the particulate matter, and you get this lovely water coming down into the Hudson. But of course, they are beautiful areas. So more and more people moved into them and started to cut the trees down. And as a result, the sediment load, the particulate matter in the water, increased dramatically to the point there was a major discussion going on about, the, they were talking about what do we do about cleaning the water up going into New York. So there's two options. One was to build one of these, a water filtration plant, and the other was to protect or to restore the forests in those two watersheds. So what they did, they looked at the cost of those two, and they found to build this was going to cost about two to six billion, with an annual running cost of about 300 million. To restore, to take those houses off and plant the trees back in there and remove the people that were moving in, was going to cost about one to 1.5 billion. So understandably, they made this decision. So the actual, the benefit, the, so they look at the societal benefit, the cost of that benefit, this was a much cheaper option. So that, when you show that, you think that sounds like a really good idea. You can see the arguments, you can see why people would go for that. But there are problems, and that's why I said I often show that example, because one of the problems is it's, it, it's incredibly complicated to work out these costs. 
I mean, this is just, a, I just picked one example, and you only have to start to look at market price, replacement costs, avoided costs, shadow market, et cetera, et cetera. It is really time consuming, and it lends itself better to work in these really big scales than when you get down to the small individual farm scales. It's very difficult on the individual farm scale to work out that cost benefit analysis. Another problem is it only tends to deal with one benefit at a time. It's not thinking of the multiple benefits you get from one asset, which is, of course, you do. It's just thinking about, in this case, clean water. But I think the biggest problem is that sometimes the replacement cost to bring in your technological solution is cheaper than it is to conserve the asset itself. And as a result of that, you could well lose it because somebody will argue it's cheaper to, plant, to build concrete than to plant or to retain the trees. So what about the other one then? So if, you, so if we go back to what I was talking about assets at the beginning, if we're really thinking about maintenance of assets, in fact, the simplest way of maintaining assets is to pay to maintain them. So that if a landowner owns, for example, a lot of these blue areas, then it's to maintain those blue areas for the assets they provide. The same here. We know we've got our blue areas here, and these areas are important for, um, very, very important for flood mitigation. So it's paying the landowner, the farmer, not to cut those trees down. And if, and I'll come on in a minute about enhancing, but it's a very different way of thinking about it, but actually probably the most simple and pragmatic way of maintaining natural capital assets going forwards, and certainly in terms of how do you make payments for public goods. If you can demonstrate the public good, then that's when the payment should flow. So these are easy to calculate. The other beauty of that approach, it tends to focus on the system as a whole, but also it, because you're not taking it down to the individual asset at such, in such detail as you did, did with the societal benefit, that you can have some assets, like the trees, that are going to provide multiple assets in there from carbon, water regulation, pollination, etc. So let's get on to the third one then. We've talked about maintaining them. That's sort of okay, but how do you enhance, what do you pay to enhance them? Who are you going to pay and how much are you going to pay if you start to put a figure on this? So I want to go back to that even load example because, I, I mean, this, as, as you know, this is one close to my heart. I live here. Um, I've experienced the flooding. Our house has experienced the flooding. And so, therefore, I am quite interested to know which of the assets in these basins, these catchments around Oxford, that result in that flooding. And if you use that same modelling approach before, you can calculate travel times through the catchment. Then actually you can then start to see on a catchment by catchment basement which areas make a high contribution to the peak flow and which areas make a low contribution. So if you want to enhance your uh, natural capital asset, you want to reduce flooding, then the areas you want to be planting your trees are in here. This is not worth it. This is the area you want to put your effort in and your money in. So the person, who, Becky, who did this modelling then, she set to, and she basically planted, so to speak, on her maps, she planted um, forest at, with a 5% forest cover, a 10 and a 20% forest cover in those areas. to see, And then she ran those models again to see what impact did these increase in trees on these catchments have on your peak flows, so those ones that give you the flooding. And sure enough, what you see in here with these catchments, so blue is when you've got 20% uh, forest. And so this is the, the difference in the discharge. So it greatly reduces the, the discharge at the peak flow. So the more tree cover you have, it works, thank goodness, but the more tree cover you have, yellow is 5%, blue is, uh, this green color is 10, and the dark blue is 20%. So by the time you get to 20% forest, you really are going to reduce, if not stop, flooding from those peak flow events in central Oxford. But how do you calculate then the cost of that for, for enhancing your land in order to do that? Well, the way to do this is going on the same approach as before. 
is say, what does that land currently have on it? So the la that, that land, this, this, she's, just, she's only done for this one, the 5%. It, it's approximately 10, uh, yeah, about 10,000 hectares we're talking about. Now, presently, you've got cereals, oilseed, rape, other crops, and grazing livestock in there. Right, so if you take that, the land you lose, because you're having to plant trees on it, the value of the trees for carbon or for timber is less than what you'd get for those crops. So therefore, when you're enhancing, you would not only have to pay to, you'd not only have to pay to maintain these crops, uh, this, this wood, but also you'd have to pay the difference. So that difference is the payment that would have to be made in order to maintain and enhance that public good or that societal benefit to reduce flooding in Oxford. Now, Dieter and, and I haven't talked about this because right now there's a big plan to have a great concrete drainage basin going through the centre of Oxford. What would be quite interesting to do, and we haven't done it, is to see how much that would cost versus the concrete drain. I suspect this would be a bit cheaper, but let's not go there. Um, but I think it's, it's really starting to use this to start to work out what does this actually mean in terms of monetary value. Because until we can really do that, then we can never have a, 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 a proper discussion with planners and, and developers because we're always saying it's nice to have, but then they're coming back with very, very hard um, arguments against that. So the last part then I want to just touch on is this question about asset based valuation of natural capital. Does it benefit all aspects of biodiversity? Let me just go back to that biodiversity slide. What have I been talking about? Well, I've been talking about this and I've been talking about this. But what I haven't been talking about is this and I haven't been talking about these. So, three very iconic UK species in here. Your red kites. So I just drove down from Oxford this evening. I saw must see about 30 of them flying over the Chilterns. Very beautiful. I also saw one in my garden earlier today in Oxford. They are all over the place. They're moving. They're mobile. Large distribution. Pine martin. I've never seen one of these. I'd love to, but they're highly elusive. They hide very, very distinctive distribution in the UK. And the lady slipper orchid. Um, again, uh, rare, very, very beautiful, found in very, very distinctive distributions in the UK. So they're all rare, they're all endangered and iconic UK species. They require very, very specific ha uh, habitats and landscapes. They are highly mobile. mobile. They, don't, they, don't, they, they, they don't constrain themselves to drainage basins. They move way beyond that, sometimes not at all, but sometimes way beyond that. But it's very, very hard to think about what societal benefit they have. If you think about all the things we've talked about, about societal benefit, we're talking about societal benefit in terms of recreation, in terms of water, in terms of clean air. But where do they fit into this framework? And I think this is, this is an issue and something that we tend to skirt around by just putting wildlife in there without really thinking, what does it mean? How do we map and bring those back into this framework? Or maybe we can't. Um, and I think, let me come on to the, I went back to the ONS. I thought, let's see what they do with their asset register. Where's biodiversity in here? How have they dealt with it? Well, they don't. So if you look down here, we've got provisioning services, we've got agriculture, fish, timber, water, all this is we're talking about. Um, some of the um, non-renewables in here, and you're regulating services, carbon, air pollution removal, cultural services, recreation. What's missing from there? Now, you could argue, well, all of those, if you, if you do all of those, biodiversity will be okay. But think about the distribution map of the, the previous one in here. Think about this. How do we know that we're going to have the right other um, regulating services or the water services in here that means we also maintain this biodiversity. So I wonder, and this is, this is this why I thought it would be provocative tonight, but I do wonder if we ha do actually have to have a different approach for dealing with the species, for these rare, um, threatened, iconic species. And 
we have a strong societal desire to maintain and enhance them. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. But I think it's, it's, it's about habitats and understanding which habitats are most at risk. It's more the other side, it's the risk side of it rather than the, the, the asset we need to be looking at. And although we'll capture some through the maintenance and enhancement, I don't think we're going to capture all of them. And I think that actually for the UK and maybe for many other areas, we ought to be more thinking about having a parallel process where we also have a, effectively a biological or biodiversity risk register so that we know where the spatial arrangements of these things are to ensure they don't fall between those gaps. Now, is that possible? Well, there are many tools out there, but I certainly, many years ago, um, I, was, I, I worked on a, um, a method to, um, to assess ecological risk for oil companies because one of the questions they asked me was, where can we damage? Slightly alarming question, I have to say at the time, but what they meant was that when they put their platform down, they want to know where to avoid which areas carry high ecological risk if you damage them, which areas have got the highest concentration of threatened species, which areas are important corridors, which areas are important for migratory routes. All of these things that actually come exactly back into this discussion now, that if we partition, if we just partition everything according to societal benefit, we may well lose that corridor that's vital for things to move across the UK landscape. And I think this possibly, or the, the, this sort of thinking is, is the way forward if we also want to conserve those parts of biodiversity that don't naturally sit within that societal benefit framing. So just to summarize then, can we put a value on biodiversity? Well, I think, I hope I've convinced you, maybe you can tell me not when we have questions, that I think if we, if, we frame natural capital, if we frame natural capital as assets to be maintained and enhanced, then I think there's huge potential for conserving important aspects of biodiversity. But I say important assets. Here I'm talking about communities, some, some populations, and definitely landscapes. I think there are an increased number of methodologies where we can now work out the spatial arrangement across landscapes of these assets and the flows that have this clear societal benefit that's going through there. And the valuation is possible. We have to be pragmatic. We cannot spend another 10 years trying to work out how to value these things. I think this is why I, I really think the maintenance and enhancement of these assets, maintaining it and paying to maintain it, is probably the way forwards. But I would argue that for other aspects of biodiversity, such as the threatened and rare species, the things like really important corridors, the things to move across landscapes in the UK or anywhere else in the world, that we need to be quite careful with this natural capital asset approach. And I, I think that those things that have no obvious flows for societal benefit, we may well now not start to need to think about creating some sort of risk register that underpins or works alongside this approach. So I hope this will lead to some questions. Um, and it's certainly for me, it's been a, an interesting process to work through these, that question that I threw that question out of thinking. When Gary asked, I thought, that's a good question. And I, earlier this week, I thought, this is probably one of the most difficult questions to ever tackle. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.